before you travel, be knowledgeable of the fact that you don't know. <laughs> and be open when you're going there, you know, just be yeah. open. Let anything happen and don't take it personally. And you'll probably be rewarded if you have that uh, mentality. Meet Kieran. He's an American writer who speaks 12 languages, been to 148 countries, and has now been living in India for three years. Kieran shared with me why foreigners don't understand India, the major differences in mentality between North and South Indians, and why he no longer wants to live in America. And Max, let's dive in. What's the biggest misconception about India for okay. people from outside? One misconception that a lot of people have about Indians who come abroad is, oh, India is so chaotic, dirty, turbulent people living in not the greatest condition, how can it be that they're so happy? And I'm saying this all in a quote. I don't personally see it that way, but that's just how a lot of people talk. Mm. And I had a really interesting uh, talk, actually, a book discussion, actually. We were on a panel with an Australian who's also like me. He was from Australia, but Indian background, uh, from Kolkata. And we were talking about, he was also talking about his experiences in uh, India. And like um, this is maybe also a difference he saw. Uh, he was saying that one thing he liked is that Indians, no matter how much or little they have, own the space that they have. So if someone is just sitting on the, you know, on the ground, has a little cot or has, you know, that straw mat or something, that is theirs. And there's a sense of, again, I'm going to say gratitude, but without trying to evoke the Western cliche of the word gratitude. Uh, there is this sense that this belongs to me. This is my straw mat. This is mine. But, and I'm so grateful that the universe gave me that. You know, the universe could have given me nothing. The universe mm. literally could have, my arm could be cut off right now. You know, I could be in excruciating pain. Or I could have been, you know, a chicken that was about to get its head caught, cut off. But the universe gave me this. I have this straw mat, I have this something. And when you accept that, not again this new age meditation way, but you genuinely are happy and genuinely feel in your heart that I have this shirt, I have this shorts, I could have had nothing but the universe gave me that. You have a warmth and happiness inside of you that people who are not used to that look at from the outside and say, oh, they're so happy despite having nothing. But it's not that, it's something else. And I'm not also going to now go into this, oh, we should be so proud of being Indian. I think there's a lot of great aspects of being any type of person of any ethnic and cultural and racial background. So I don't want to get into that. But at the end of the day, no matter how much India is progressing, 60% uh, of Indians still live under a dollar a day, right? And still, uh, India was colonized by the British. I mean, when in, there were signs in the Indian railways, no dogs, no Indians allowed, you know, in public spaces in India, you know, when the British were here, you know? So there was such a strong stigma towards being what you were you yeah. know literally like literally no dog no indian like you are equivalent to a dog you know which is a unfortunately color and a lot of people who are like indian or african even a lot of black people also still we're still learning to love ourselves for being different in these ways you know or yeah. learning to decolonize ourselves from these certain ways of thinking most countries in asia i think i said russia also have the certain kind of idea you know there's certain based on your shade of skin tone you know you're kind of ranked <laughs> and you know uh, it's not necessarily about it is racism i mean i think for whatever reason even down to the aboriginals of australia we have such a we still to people who are dark or properly black you know we still have a lot of uh, degradation and someone like myself I'm fairly light I'm pale even for Indian standards but when I go to a white skinned country I am actually considered dark I go from fair to dusky somehow <laughs> fair to dusky sometimes but just by going to Russia you know <laughs> so it's uh you know we are compared by skin tones and for whatever reason we have it in our head that the lighter skinned you are the more respect you deserve in society uh, how we got there I think is beyond me and it's probably even beyond one explanation because there must have been many sources across different national backgrounds and cultures so I don't want to I, I don't think I can answer that uh, however yeah a lot of Indians do like to be I don't know I think even I like it you know I like when someone comes and they rather than just saying oh India's hell like some people do they actually are saying positive things you know because I think a lot of us we internalize all these horrible things about us in the media as well so you know you grow up hearing these horrible things about your country the way things are the way you're meant to be and then when you hear someone actually appreciate you you yeah. feel a certain like, well, that's nice, you know. They yeah. don't think we're hell or we, they don't think we're all dirty, you know. That's nice, you know. So a lot of people will want that. And that comes from a very logical perspective, you know. I mean, I would just ask people like uh, maybe to just uh, not give it so much importance both for yourself 
and for others, it's okay, you know, you, you are in existence, you have your own beauty. I realized that I don't like making these types of generalizations living in Mexico. I would encounter the typical foreigner who would come to Mexico, typical mm. white person, and then this random British guy. And I was just, you know, we were all talking randomly. And the British guy is, was complaining about Mexico. Oh, Mexico, blah, blah, blah. But then he said, oh, but at least Mexico is better than India. India is hell. He called India <laughs> hell. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I literally was ready to <laughs> slap oh, him. Shit. I know. Yeah. And I was just thinking, you f***ing privileged white boy who's getting the chance to go on these lavish $1,000 vacations to India and Mexico, <laughs> spending thousands of pounds. Meanwhile, you know, the sabji wala here is probably not even able to afford a thousand pounds in a year let yeah. alone you know imagine exotic vacations to india and mexico and i was just thinking of all these lovely people he probably met who just saw a white person were like oh come in come in you know, stay at my house do all this and yeah you know and then he goes around and calls their country hell you know and i was just so angry <laughs> and you know i was angry also because you know i just realized and i saw a lot of this in mexico how many people travel you know consumerism has become such a normalized part of our life you know we go one day i want to have thai food okay i didn't like this restaurant zero stars in europe i'm going to have uh, fijian food you know three stars you know so we've made everything into that you know we have made everything like i'm going you know going to india going to mexico as a white british person like going to six flags you know i'm going to go on six flags i didn't like the ride it's horrible I I don't like the ride mm. you know it's a very eat pray love mentality also like you know i can just go to these places and i can kind of use these places for my oh i like this place no i don't like this place oh i did this i did that you mm. know it's like a consumerism but unlike fijian food unlike six flags which are things and material objects india is a country with 1.3 billion people and uh, it's uh, any country mexico i think has maybe 40 million, don't quote me on that, I don't know the pop, maybe 200 million, I don't know the population of Mexico, but when you're saying these things, you're not, you're basically telling an entire, com not even community, because you know, you have Gujaratis, you have Marwadis, you have uh, people from Sikkim or Telangana, <coughs> or you have people from Oaxaca, or Zapotec people from Oaxaca, I mean, you're, you're basically reducing every lived experience in the same way you've had this very rich lived experience, living in Krasnoyar, <coughs> living five years in um, Singapore, etc. Yeah. You're reducing that into all of this is hell. All this is objectively bad, you know, without yeah. even thinking about it, you know. Speaking about like you being an American citizen, what part of you is American? What part of you is Indian? And what part of you is global citizen? I even wrote a story in Kannada actually, partly in Kannada, partly in English. Hopefully someday it will get published. It's from some of my earlier writings where I literally imagine myself, what if I were just an American? What if I were just an Indian? Mm. Like from day one, you know, and I just... Yeah literally imagine the story of these two alternative versions of myself, you know? But the fact that I can do that is also a fact that I have the psychologies of both nations inside of my head. And I, you know, I wrote a list also. I had a friend who's a Telugu girl who's from here but lives in Paris. And after a conversation, I decided to write on a, this was in 2018, I wrote on a piece of paper, American and Indian. And then I literally wrote like how an American look at this? How would an Indian look at that? How would an American look at this? And I literally could justify and answer every single question in my head as an American, as an Indian. So I'm both, you know, I have the psychologies very much of both and yeah. I belong to both. And I'm not one of these people, you know, there's this kind of stereotype that, you know, you go to India and you're seen as an American, you go to the US, you're seen as an Indian, or a rather brown skinned person because yeah. people in the US don't even know that much, they'll just say brown skinned. <laughs> and likewise, Indians don't know that much, they'll just think Firangi, or, you know, a person who's from a foreign country. Yeah. But um, the uh, point is, is that I think I'm both and I feel like an Indian when I live in India and I feel like an American when I live in the US and when mm. I go to the US and visit my parents it just feels like I'm taking one shoe off, I'm taking my chappal off and I'm putting on a shoe basically and yeah, when I come yeah. back here I'm taking my shoe off and putting on a chappal so it feels really uh, effortless for me but I also made the effort How many countries do you travel to? One nimsha, one nimsha, health nimsha yagi Nooru ayavattu Nanu nooru ayavattu bedi deshikilige hogi dene Portuguese? Wow, that's so yeah, funny. It's it? Canada. No, it's a South Indian language. Ah, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, but I follow Portuguese também. Se queres, podemos falar. I follow relatively Portuguese, because yeah. antes vivi in Portugal. É o português é muito parecido com o espanhol, então é muito fácil falar isso. Yeah, for you, it's like it's a natural talent, or you have some some special technique to how to do it. When I studied other languages, I made a point to pick up a beginner's book. I'd pick up a beginner's book like learning Hindi conversational, learning Indonesian conversational, uh -huh. learning Japanese conversational. And then I would pick it up 
and then I would uh, ultimately uh, learn all the grammar. I would memorize like how to count in this language, how to use this or that in that language. And then I would practice it. I would go to a bus and I'd talk to the bus driver. Mm. Or I would talk to the person who is at the convenience store. And slowly I would learn properly these languages. And if I had like three to six months, I could pick up like to speak like decently, like, you know, like enough to manage a basic conversation. Mm. If I were there for a year longer, I would learn like more profoundly, you know, to start mm. to be able to use it in a deeper way. What would be your advice to someone who want to really understand the place, not from touristic perspective, but from like a local perspective, what should you do? You come to a new country, yeah. and then wh where you go? I am, you know, I think I'm just a weirdo because really I never stay in the places everyone else stays in, you know? Like I end up choosing like to stay in random suburbs <laughs> <laughs> of places and people, but that's what helps. So when yeah. I was in um, Shanghai, I was in Huatao. Huatao is a pro like a neighborhood an hour away from the center. Yeah. I stayed in proper China. I stayed in a place where the roads were barely paved, although now it's been some years. I was there in 2016, so mm. maybe now it's like very modern, high tech. But Hua Tao, at the time I lived there, it was like literally like India, you know, you had potholed roads, nice like uh, little comfortable roads with trees like inching themselves out of the pavement, you know, like those types of roads, mm. you know, and people sitting and playing like, you know, mahjong, you know, yeah. uh, you know, outside their apartment, like uncles, you know, sitting and playing mahjong. And you know, you had like traditional Chinese food, like, you know, those small little eateries where, you know, you have like a little buffet and then you have people sitting in chairs and, you know, these are like, like village people. So they're very friendly. So, you mm -hmm. know, they were, they were so happy to see someone who's like really random, like me staying there. And I was trying to learn Chinese. So I would speak at them and they would speak at me. And yeah. that's how I would learn Chinese, you know, I would sit in that restaurant and talk to people in the department store. And I like in Maine, China, like in Maine, Shanghai, like people there were friendly because it was like a village place, you know. I don't know if that's for everyone though, because I see a lot of people who are travelers who they say they want that off the beaten path experience, but then when they're on it, they complain. <laughs> so then I don't know if that's what everyone wants. But for me, I don't, it's not, it's also an accident. Like I was in Rio just now, I was invited to do uh, the biennial, the literary biennial in Rio. They have a lit fair, a lit fair there and I was invited as a speaker to mm. go. So I decided to book a hotel next to Rio Fest, which was supposed to be the place where the festival was. Mm. I accidentally, I just Googled Rio Fest and it was not even the right place. The place I was supposed to go was like 30 kilometers to the west. It was a completely different place, but yeah. I just looked up Rio Fest and then done. I was there and then I ended up seeing all these uh, interesting things. Like again, it looked like India. It looked like, again, trash was everywhere. Uh, again, these uh, potholed roads with trees inching out of the potholes, mm. you know, like trees growing out of potholes. And it, it was exactly like India. And I was just thinking, like, if I stayed in proper Rio, I would have had a very different experience. But I just end up picking these places. But, you know, those are the best places. Like, if you're staying in Mumbai, try staying in Ghatkopad and see how that, <laughs> how that goes for you, you know. Coming to India since I was a little boy has really helped me understand other developing countries in a way mm. that other people who grew up in the U.S. or Western countries don't have. Like. I saw it when it was, I mean, now India is actually fairly okay. There was, if you had come in the 90s, it was, uh, it was a very different country, you know. And awareness is the key. Before you travel, be aware of your limitations. Be aware of how little you know, whether you're an Indian going to Thailand for the first time, or whether you're a Thai person coming to India for the first time. Be aware and be knowledgeable of the fact that you don't know. <laughs> and be open when you're going there, you know. Just be yeah. open. Let anything happen and don't take it personally. Just let it be. Whatever happens, you know, rene do, as they say in Hindi, let it be, you know. Yeah. And you'll probably be rewarded if you have that uh, mentality. I get very offended or hurt because I'm very sensitive. I get very offended or hurt by something someone says. And I just decide to take a breath and I just try to imagine the same thing that hurt me, offended me, but from their perspective. And then it makes sense. And then I think, oh, it's okay, actually. I understood it. You know, they weren't trying to harm me. This is just what happened in that situation. Can you recall any example like of this kind of situation? Oh, so many, so <laughs> many. And just three days ago, I was just walking around. I, I like to go for my morning walk, 9 to 11 on the bandstand. And I just started like walking, you know, I just looked like those other people who just having their morning exercise basically. Yeah. And I walked towards <coughs> Bandra Fort. I'm just walking and these uh, random kids, like 19, 20 year olds on their bikes come and Bhaiya, park pitch ka hai? And I... What's that? Oh, like Bhaiya, Bhaiya is like this uh, very North Indian thing, like 
bro. It's like bro. Uh, and uh, but I said it because I'm a polite person by nature, so it's hard for me to sound like the way they sounded. But it was very like imposing and sort of uh, the way they said it was like basically like stop what you're doing and listen and help me sort mm -hmm. of way. And I like to help people, but it was like in that certain. Again, it's <laughs> I don't want because a lot of the people in your. Um, feed will be North Indian so I don't and I happen to be a South Indian by origin so <laughs> I'm not trying to make it about that but to an extent it is also about that I mean the the tone of their voice and the way they said it was very sort of um oh you know like yeah. imposing rough aggressive and I just got annoyed because you know I'm not your bhaiya basically is what mm. I was thinking like I'm just a random person walking you know and I did help them but I was a little annoyed after you know uh, because again, South Indians, uh, at least Mysore, so my family roots in Mysore, that's where my grandmother lives, that's where we have a second home, will say something more lines of, excuse me, sir, mm. could you please help me find the park space? You know, like it's a little bit politer. So mm. people who are from UP, Haryana, are stereotyped to be a little bit more aggressive, you know, which they don't mean me harm. So that's why, again, so I was a little annoyed with them for 10 minutes in my head, like who are they to you know, talk to me like this, basically. <laughs> but then I thought about it, you know, in the Haryana, UP culture, that's just their way of speaking. There's some of these things are just like, you know, small things. But, you know, of course, now talking in front of the camera, I think it's silly and it's not something I would get annoyed with. But, you know, in that particular moment, you know, I get annoyed yeah. by those small things, you know. And then I, but then I imagine, like, you know, I literally pretend I'm that little 20-year-old, like how he's speaking, what he's thinking about. Mm. And then it makes sense. And I'm like, okay, it's fine. What's the biggest difference in, like, let's say, mindset or mentality? Let's say, if you compare Westerners, well, it's a generalization, of course, but let's say, typical Westerner, and like typical Hindu from India. I will say that before I even begin generalizing, every person is their own individual. But yeah, I think anyone who comes to India for the first, well, there are certain things that are also physiological. Like a lot of people who are not used to India would have trouble with the pollution, the air, the food, the heat. That's Mumbai. If you go to Bangalore, Shilong or something, it'd be very different. Uh, those are all physiological and that have nothing to even do with India itself because I went to Mexico and I had the worst diarrhea I had in my life for three weeks. <laughs> I ate some things and I had non-stop diarrhea every 30 minutes for three weeks. I literally <laughs> lost a lot of weight. I had Montezuma's wow, revenge, you know? So it happens anyway that yeah. you're not exposed to the water. If you're not exposed to the water, I've never had that in India also because I've been coming. Except when I was a little boy at that time, I'd get extremely sick. But now I eat everything and I'm fine. But if you're not exposed to the water or the bacteria at a very early age, it's very easy for you to fall prey to something. If you just And you have to go through it. I mean, even when I decided to settle in Bombay, like in 2020, 2021 December when I decided I'm going to make this my home I had because of COVID I'd been away from India for almost a year a year and a half because of COVID so and I was not or two years actually and I had never spent that long it was usually every three four months I'd be here you know yeah. so this was like two years without India so when I had to come back the pollution was really bad the I, I had a horrible time getting used to the air, the heat, the air pollution. Uh, it took me three weeks, and that's a sad thing because most people who have a foreign trip only have it for three weeks, you know? Mm. But you need those three weeks just for your body to get used to it, yeah. you know? So after I had those three weeks where my body could acclimatize, everything was normal. But a lot of people are only coming for that amount of time and they leave to another place. So their body is just starting to acclimatize yeah. and then they go to another place and have to re-acclimatize again. So that's a huge problem. A lot of the people, they come and they're like, oh God, it's so much noise, so much chaos, so much this. And then I tell them, you're jet lagged. You just came from the UK to India. You've only <laughs> slept three hours. Yeah. You are dealing with a completely different time zone. Sleep, don't focus on anything else, just sleep. And I think the fact that one, I've made them aware that it's also jet lag. And then I'm telling them like they sleep in my, I have a lovely apartment and I have a nice bed and I let them sleep and then the next day they're usually completely fine you know like yeah. they're enjoying they're having fun and they're, you know I think just knowing those small things also if you're a foreigner you know like because you know foreigners have this little I mean I'm not trying to <laughs> criticize every foreigner who comes to India but you know they have this way of you know oh it's so chaotic yeah it's so chaotic oh it's dirty yeah it's so dirty and they just echo chamber you know each yeah. other so as a result they don't think about other things that could be resulting in them also having this experience you know so you know sometimes breaking that and saying this could be a jet lag or this could be some other psychological issue you're dealing with that India is now bringing up to you uh, helps them usually break out of that. What do you start understanding about the US, about the society, about the country after start traveling and moving abroad? Oh, so many things. I mean, I was very critical of the US and I still am very critical. I think that's healthy. I'm also very critical about India uh, or any country. You know, but one thing I'm very happy to see, however, is a lot of the complaints I had of the US are self-rectifying. 
I mean, Americans are becoming more educated, more cosmopolitan, more open, you know, like more open to diverse experiences, hmm. more open to LGBT. Uh, it's not as the stereotypical, like <coughs> typical Pennsylvania, Dakota mentality that you would have had 20. It still is there. It's still a huge part of the conflict there. But I see a lot of growth and progress also. I see, it's, it's more tense, if anything, because when I grew up, that very right wing extremist view was just the norm, you know, like up to the 9-11 period. And that's why 9-11 had so many issues as well. It was just the norm, right, for people to think that way. Whereas yeah. now it's become fragmented. You have people who are very left wing, very liberal, yeah. very open, cosmopolitan. And then you have the other other side which is pretty much identical to what I had when I grew up but now at least that other side is much stronger so and there's a lot of difference I'm not even though I recognize myself to be from the US I myself can't imagine myself living there anymore I like living here and you know I think for me it's also like connection more than anything like I like living in the land of my ancestors although I also then need to say I should be living in Karnataka because Maharashtra is not the land of my ancestors <laughs> so the state of Maharashtra and yeah. Mumbai have nothing to do with me but you know I like living in a global city on a land that belongs to my ethnic heritage. I like living in a city that allows me to eat one day Vietnamese food, order Tex-Mex, uh, while also sometimes speaking in Hindi and Kannada, or, you know, encountering people from mm. all over the world, like yourself, you know, or like myself as well, you know. So I like living in a city like Mumbai. And Mysore also, it's, you must know Mysore also has a lot of people who come to do yoga and all that, and it's also changed a lot. It's become very diverse and more open-minded. I, I also really, for a lot of time, have been thinking, should I settle in Mumbai or Mysore? Because Mysore is where my roots are. That's where my grandmother's house is. That's where my mother tongue is. And it's also a great city with lovely people. But I've chosen Mumbai because I just think the globalness of it and the cosmopolitanness and yeah. that openness and bigness speak to me more. But uh, the US is also a great country. I don't actually have anything to complain about. But you, you mentioned that you wouldn't live there. It doesn't fit um. me anymore. It never fit me. I was really bullied a lot when I grew up in the 90s, early 2000s. People always saw me as a different kid. Of mm. course, I was born and brought up in Mangalore. Maybe that would have been the same thing. My family's from Mangalore, you know, yeah. that side of India. Uh, maybe it would have been just as bad because it would have also been a provincial. I grew up in, not in Atlanta, but like a, a town, you know, like maybe 40 kilometers south of Atlanta. So it wasn't like the most open place. It was, it, you know, it's like... Although it's also a very interesting town for, yeah. you know, if you're interested in like the race conflicts of uh, the U.S., it's a lovely town. But um, I had a lot of issues growing up there. And uh, I think I still, and I, I find it a little boring, I think, as well, because it's a lot of empty land and a lot of people. I'm sorry, here's a lot of people. It's a lot of empty land and it's a lack of people, lack of things to do unless you were willing to drive mm. 40 minutes to go to Atlanta. And I don't like to drive, so that's another huge issue. Without a car, what are you doing in these places, right? Yeah. Now, I could live in New York. I love New York. That was my question, actually. I would love to live in yeah. New York. New York is really f***ing expensive. <laughs> I cannot afford. So to give you context, I'm really not trying to brag at all. But just so last year, I earned off of my web page, my novel, about 12 lakh. That's about $15,000. $15,000 is pretty good for India. It's mm. like I can live like an upper middle class lifestyle. $15,000 in the US is below, way below the poverty line. You know, like I would not even be able to afford like anything, you know. Yeah. So I would literally live like the homeless, like, you know, the people who are homeless in India, yeah. or the people who are homeless in the US. That's what I would live like. So it doesn't make sense. So yeah. that's another aspect of it. The prices, they don't work in my favor. Do you have a solution how to make um, a world a better place? place like to be more acceptive to be more not so divided exactly what we're doing now having conversations I think uh, getting to know each other connecting beyond the superficial people just think you know because of a certain skin tone or background or all these things that you have to be a certain way and I think having the chance to three-dimensionalize people is really important and to give people a sense of humanity and to remember that we share a piece of ourselves inside of every other living existence you know there's a piece of me because i also look at you and i see you so even though i'll never know you or what's inside of you there's a piece of me that has looked inside of you for this one moment and therefore feels as though there's a part of me that belongs to you just like there's a part of you that feels like a part of me mm. is also inside of you so when we learn to see other people as a part of us it would be like me uh, deciding to cut off my arm, you know? Like, just because, you know, you're from Palestine, you're from Israel, doesn't matter. I mean, it's like cutting off my arm, you know? But um, it's easier said than done. I mean, people are born and brought up also around conflict, around depression. I mean, 
Also in India, there's a lot of uh, issues. I mean, people face discrimination for being different all the time here, but it's from, you know, from post-partition, like partition created a lot of divides in India that unfortunately still linger to this day. The British colonialism, which also again, created a lot of divisions based on caste and class that still linger to this day. I mean, any country, Russia, Brazil, US, there's so many divisions and most people live in that. And they're taught to live in that because we're only surrounded by our immediate environment, right? And what we're taught. And if you're living in India, I mean, every day, that's all you're here is, oh, Muslims are like this, or people who are Adivasi are like this, or South yeah. Indians are like this. Uh, so you don't have that chance to be aware that that could itself be a misconception, uh, that those things you're thinking in your head could be an illusion, right? So just being, but that being said, maybe even watching something like this and having someone say that, could this be an illusion? Could this not be the case? Could even be helpful enough, you know, because then yeah. you yourself will start to wonder, so, and that's why I write, that's why I write the books I write also, to break people from their illusions, you know. Yeah. After the interview, Kiran treated me to dinner, uh, that's the Indian hospitality for you, and told me about his new book, Speaking in Tongues. It combines three different poetry collections, originally written in Spanish, Mandarin and Turkish, and self-translated into English by Kiran, and the link in description. So guys, thanks for watching, see you very soon with more stories from India and all around the world.